Hello everyone, welcome back. Tonight we're going to dive back into more material design in XAML. It's been a long week, it's been a rough day. We're going to do something fun because I need to unwind. Um, so, let me just dive right in. The Actually, before I get too carried away. For anybody who hasn't seen it yet, one, I'm a Get Kraken fanboy, if that wasn't obvious. Uh, 9.11 just dropped uh, Wednesday, December 13th, which is today at least at time of recording. Um, a lot of cool stuff in here. A lot of it is focused around the focus view and the the cloud patches. So if either of those features are at all interesting to you, um, I'm gonna be making some videos around uh, some additional Git Kraken features coming up here in the near future, specifically around the Git Kraken CLI because it's a pretty cool thing. So sneak peek, sneak peek. Uh, so, no, not client. Stop auto coding for me. Uh, this guy. This guy. This guy. Oh, for anybody who's interested. So, just brief primer on this. The Git Kraken CLI is not like a replacement for the Git CLI or anything weird like that. Um, this is an additional command line tool to augment your development experience. That's probably a better way of saying it. Um, the entire idea here is Git Kraken offers a lot of features beyond just Git integration. So, yeah, you can do push, pull, branch, merge, rebase, all the all the fancy Git stuff. Um, but a lot of what they've been adding is things around uh, making teams collaborate more effectively. So this CLI here is actually free. And here's the fun part. You don't even need an account to use this. Now, a lot of features do require you to have an account and log in, but there are several features in here around like the workspaces and whatnot that don't even require you to log into a Git Kraken account. And you can just use these. Like you can make a local workspace and like pull a bunch of repos and use it for uh, organization and that kind of thing. So um, gonna make a video kind of diving into the latest features there. Uh, 1.2.2 dropped two weeks ago. It's pretty cool. Expect to see that on the YouTube's soon okay so was poking around at the 5.0 release i'm aware that i failed to update um some of the obsolete styles from last week but i also remember that i've got a pipeline that automatically generates this whole list of control styles i'm just gonna diff these and i'm gonna cheat so um but there's a huge number of items in here all around the flipper control so let's i my my thought is and a while back Let's see. I found it too. I found it. That's why I have my Kraken open. I found my old branch. So this fix 2505 branch, I had started in on some work with a flipper to try to make it usable. So here's here's the problem with the flipper control. And let me let me just launch and all a picture's worth a thousand words. Like there are a lot of bugs around this flipper. Um what branch am I on? I did I oh I'm oh I'm on ye oldie branch. Okay, so we're gonna launch something that's real old. I thought I was back up on master. Oops. We uh we might have to switch back. Because this is this is old enough that I uh Yeah, you'll notice we've got packages with vulnerabilities this old. Yeah, so that's that's not great. But okay. Uh let's see, where is the flipper? In the cards thing, I think? Yeah. So here's the idea. The flipper flips, right? And as you can see, this, this branch that I'm on has plenty of bugs and it's obnoxious and annoying. But that's basically the premise is it is a card-like thingy that flips. That's it. And this entire animation, um, WPF has a, um, a, a 3D area that most people don't play with. Um, because it's around kind of like graphics rendering stuff and most people who want to do 3D type things dive into like a full-blown game engine framework. They, they don't do the, the 3D stuff in WPF too much. It has its uses, but it's kind of limited. Um, but it makes for some pretty cool flipping animations too. So the, the problem is, is because it's doing that, it's not actually XAML content. So we're going to close Visual Studio because I have no idea what it's about to do when I change branches back to master. Um, because it is doing that, it's leveraging a visual brush, which basically means it's taking a snapshot of your UI content 
and using that in the, the rendered flip, which is kind of problematic um, for a variety of reasons. Usually the one that people bump into first is they change their theme colors and go, oh, my flipper didn't update when I changed my theme colors, but the rest of it did. It's like, yeah, that's because it took a snapshot and well, you got whatever the snapshot was. So that's not, that's kind of no bueno. Um, and that branch that I was on um, kind of started down the path of what I think is a viable solution. And I, I was going to potentially play with it a little bit more tonight because there's a couple of use cases for this flipper. Now, the hardest one is when the front and back side of the card are different sizes, right? If the front and back are the same size, things get a little bit easier. You can kind of do your animations and away we go. Um, but when they're different sizes, you kind of have to do something about it, especially when it's layout size, it's not rendered size, layout size, because that means when you flip the card, like maybe the content gets pushed down or, or brought up because it's bigger or smaller. And so things get, things get awkward and different. So the goal here is to, I, I, I think, where did it go? Did flippers move into their own? Oh no, they're just way over here. Why is the card thing? Oh, it must have been in a wrap panel before and it's not anymore. So here's here's how the flipper's supposed to work, right? That's the magic, right? Whoop, 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 right? And there's the resize, which is the problematic case, right? But it's it's a kind of a cool little animation. And the idea being that halfway through that flip, the size switches, and then we finish the flip. That's that's the goal. Now here's the failure case, right? If we go whoop. You can see because it snapshotted those controls, they're still dark theme, despite the fact that the rest of the app is now updated. So this is the most common bug. The other one that people sometimes run into, um, and I don't have Zunit and Karnak, I really got to get those just added to my startup script, um, is there's a, a difference that you will note between the text over here and the text over here. Right, and the difference is what's uh, called true type fonts, and you can see how this. Oftentimes, people will describe it as it looks blurry. Is the is the effect that they get, especially with smaller fonts, um, and the reason is because these little guys here, you can see, it's just kind of grays all around the edge. It doesn't get that sharp lines, and that's because when you take these visual brushes, they don't have the ability to actually know how to properly render the text. It's just a snapshot in time rather than like the layering of text on things. So it kind of mitigates one of the best features. So here's my thinking. I am thinking that when the flipper is sitting in this state, it should be pure UI elements, nothing fancy. I'm thinking when the flipper is in this state, it should be pure UI elements. And the only time it needs to be anything else is during that animation. So I would like to take another run at this flipper. I would like to have it perform a flip. And I, I think what we might do is just build a brand new control here. So this is going to kind of be build a control from scratch. But in this case, scratch is going to be uh, blatantly poach all of the code from the other control. But I think we'll have them side by side so we can do a compare and contrast rather than just changing it out wholesale. Yeah, I also, yeah, like this just, it feels, it's so wrong. So wrong. Okay. I mean, it's cool, it's cool that we've got this, but. Okay, so let's go look at how it works. Uh, flipper. Uh, boom, okay. So this is this is what's actually doing it. This plain 3D bit is where the the magic actually happens. So you know, this does derive from framework element, right? And then logical child, visual child, original child, and then all of this stuff in here around this rotation. Uh, and the problems come somewhere in here where yeah, this is where we now start to do all of the the magic and this this line right here is functionally what's causing the this is the source of so much of the problem is 
the a visual brush in WPF because we've got solid color brushes, gradient brushes. They're technically a radial brush that people occasionally play with. Um, but a visual brush is its purpose in life is to be able to act like a brush, but have its source be some other UI element, which is a really powerful thing. Like you can do mirror effects and all kinds of cool things with it. Um, rendering text is not something you should do with it. It's crap for that. Don't do that. Um, but this is basically what's biting us. I don't know what I, why is, why is this thing now have an air? Oh, because I drug the D away. Uh, and there's some caching stuff in here that it goes through and does and all of this rotational stuff and all of this. So here's my thinking. I'm thinking we can potentially get away with this. The 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 big issue here is this guy is I, I think what I'd like to build is something that can perform a flip animation given to UI elements. Because this one here is trying to do it with children. Right? So if we look at where uh plain 3D gets used, I think this comes in through the um apply template if I remember right. Yeah, so if we go and look at the flippers template. Doo -doo -doo. Flipper, flipper, flipper. Okay, and we go here, we go plain uh, 3D. Except for you spell 3D correctly, because that's, that's better. Why is this thing not at 100%? Be big, thank you. Um, Okay, so you'll note here, uh, we've got a visual state manager, we've got some visual states, we've got some easing functions in that it is animating the rotation property. So this plain 3D class was kind of set up-ish to get us closer to what we want. So you'll see that that's what it's targeting. If we go down here, we can see here, but the, the problem that I have with it is it's set up like this. And it's, it's set up to do this capturing of elements. And I just, no, no, that's what I don't like. I, I want these, the, the end result that I'm looking for is these two content presenters end up being um, uh, siblings of each other. And we finish out the, the animations there. Because I'm, I'm sort of thinking that when the animation starts, the plain 3D becomes visible. The, the we'll call it the front side content is hidden. It goes away. The plane does the animation as it exists today. Halfway through, it's gonna flip to the backside animation, finish, make the back content visible, drop the plain 3D. That's the game plan. Because you can do all of that with a storyboard. Right, because all of all of this storyboard, it's it's animating a rotation property, and then when it gets all the way to the right point, it's toggling the visibility property of these presenters. Right, and it's just flipping those things around. But I think there's the the, the way it's laid out. I just I don't think is quite quite right. So we're gonna we're gonna just start cannibalizing some of this and and changing it up. Okay, so uh, we will very eloquently well we're gonna stop debugging first of all and we are going to call this uh flipper new i think for now um at some point it, it, it will become flipper and the other one will die and that will go away okay so we got to clean up some stuff here stuff here but at least this way now we can test side by side and we can powwow and, and go to town Okay, so this thing has front content, back content, it's got the templates. The structure of the flipper itself, I think is pretty okay. Um, gotta make you the right type. Um, this, remeasure during flip. We might have to, yeah. Yeah, this is gonna, this is gonna need to, to, to die. I don't like this. Like, I understand what this is doing is it's saying we need to do this. But if we swap out the visible content and stop doing the visual state, we won't have this problem. Like, this whole thing is around working around issues with that plain 3D. Um, so actually, you know what we're going to do? 
since I don't like it, we're going to kill it and get rid of it. Okay, so now what we would like to have is probably a couple template parts because at the end of the day, the structure that we're going to be going for here, uh, let's see here. This is style. Yeah, we'll just do, should we do a card flipper first? Maybe the card flipper makes more sense. They're more or less the exact same. We'll do the, we'll do the card style first. We're just going to duplicate this guy real quick. Boom. Okay. And then we're going to come up here. Um, and just see the card flipper new. Because that's how we, that's how the professionals name things. Um, okay. Target type. Uh, based on. I wonder why these are based on each other. What is this thing setting that the other one isn't? Literally one thing. Yeah, we don't need a based on. Uh, oops, that one, that one can stay. This one we don't need a based on. Okay, and then this should be flipper new. Jared, how you doing, buddy? Long time no chat. Okay, and then we want to, like, this whole mess is the yucky. Yucky, 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 yucky. So this is what we want to change out. So I don't remember what Z factor is. What is this even used for? Z factor. No music tonight. No, I've gotten a bunch of people not liking it and would prefer to put their own music on. So I've, I'm experimenting again and rolling without for the moment. I have no idea what this property is even used for. It's clearly very important with its one usage. Create a camera that looks down the negative Z axis with up as Y and positioned right halfway in and Y and X on the Z. Are these links even still valid? I mean, it's, yeah, that's what scares me is the link had the word, uh, 2007 in it so this was uh clearly top tier tech top tier up uh, you know decade and a half ago um yeah so we're trying to build a better flippy flippy control because the current one makes my head go flippy flippy which is just not quite the effect that we're going for Okay, so now, okay, so we'll leave the Z factor in for the moment. The rotation Y can, can hang out. So the, the real question then is how we, how we want to change this up. So this is going to end up being, um, where, where is this guy? We're going we're gonna to duplicate this guy as well for now. Plain 3D, new, and we're going we're gonna to just, we're going to do this. Okay. Um, and he is not going to have a content property and that's going to be the, that's going to be the kicker. Is this link valid? This one also has the word to that. Yeah. Uh, does this have the parallax? I remember reading this blog. Dead simple 3d with a stupid, simple name. Yeah, this is the, the, so for those interested, this is more or less Actually, does this one work with my fancy link? Oh, it does. That's cool. Um, this one here is more or less what this is based on, right? Of being able to adjust this. But his example has the same flaw as um, the one that we're doing in that it it relies on that visual brush and we just really don't want that. We don't want the brush outside of the animation. So we want plain 3D new. Uh, this thing is now unhappy because it says, what you talking about? Uh, and then we want to slap all of you inside like a grid. Put you down here, paste you here. And we're going to do something more akin to this, I think. I think this is a little closer to what we're going to be going for. 
because now we're going to make the front and the back content siblings. Uh, let's see, plain 3D is unacceptable. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sure I've broken lots of stuff in here. Uh, I'm just also noticing I probably broke all the dependency properties back on my other one as well, which is exciting. Uh, a great way if you want to confuse yourself with bugs is to not get your owner type set correctly. A real great way to confuse yourself for hours on end. So, if you're ever uh, thinking that your life is too easy, just go change your, some of your owner types. It'll fix it for you. Uh, okay, and then we're just going to... Can I just... Hey, autocode. Um, yeah, do them all. Thanks. Appreciate that. Make it so. Thank you, Automatic AI. I, per, I like you. Um, okay. It would be really cool is if it could do all this work for me. Because that would be, that'd be pretty epic. Um, I don't think it can. Oh, that was the flipper that I wanted to keep. That was the one I wanted to get rid of. Uh, regardless, though, the plain 3D, this guy comes in here, this guy does all this. So at some point, this one was previously based around the idea of this child property being set and it going through and getting all of the stuff and that kind of thing. We're going to whack all that crap. I'm thinking what we're going to do instead is this guy is going to be given his front and his back content. And when he is, so when he's told to animate, Snapshot, snapshot, do the, the switch, then go away. That's his goal. So he's going to end up needing a couple more probably framework element properties on here that we will set at the point we go to do the, the flips. But let's get those things set up properly. What is your problem here? Plain 3D doesn't exist. Yes, it does. Figure it out. I'm, I'm real confident it exists because we just added it. Probably wasn't compiling, and so the designers probably just lost its mind. Okay, so we are going to end up giving him a front and a back, and I think... I think what we almost want to do here... I don't know why these things have render transform origins set on them. I don't think we're going to be applying render transforms to either of these directly anymore. So, this guy's going to go in a card. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and yell at me for a minute. Go ahead and yell at me. I understand. You don't like me. I, I get it. I get it. I get it. You're unhappy. You're allowed to be unhappy. And then I need you to go away and shut up. Okay. So, that goes like that. This goes like this. Okay. So, key things here. We've got two cards that are siblings of our plain 3D view. Um, I think we actually want to bring this guy down so he is higher in the Z order, meaning he will sit functionally on top. Um, because during animation, we would like him to be the one on uh, higher up so he can cover up these ones. Um, it probably won't matter much because the intent will be to hide these cards while the animation is occurring. So we're going to give each of these names. Uh, let's see. X name, uh, part. Uh, let's go with uh, front content. Right, so something like that. And then we're going to come down here and do something like this guy. We're going to go with back content. And for the most part, these things should all work, right? Format my XAML. Thanks. I'm too lazy to think. Um, that all works. That seems fine. That seems fine. Now we have the visual states. Hey, Izzy. Merry Christmas to you as well. We are... Attempting to fix all of my flipper bugs all at once because I can kill off half of the remaining items in the 5-0 milestone that because they're all related to flipper bugs. 
And I, I kind of want to do this for the 501 because I strongly suspect that my fix is going to be a breaking change for everybody using the flipper. I don't know how many people are actually using it in like big apps because of all the bugs with it though. So I'm kind of gambling that I can break people and hopefully people aren't too angry. But it should be a simplish upgrade. Simplish upgrade. I think it's going to be setting two properties instead of one. I think that's what it's going to be. Um, okay, so for the animations, let's just focus on the situation here. So this guy, for the unflipped case, unflipped meaning what's the flipper? Great question. That is a wonderful question. The, as the name implies, it goes flippy flippy um, like a fish. Goes flop, 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 flop. Um, but a demonstration. So this th this control here, which is a very nice little control, and it, it's I don't use it a lot in my own apps because of the following bug. That one. It doesn't respond to theme changes. Um. And then the the other bug that people flag it for is the font. They'll often say looks blurry is usually the bug report. Short, short version, because it's being rendered as a visual brush, it looks like crap. Um, and they are absolutely correct. So that's what we're aiming to fix. I'm going to just detach. Uh, okay, so down here, what we would like to do is the front content. We're going to toggle the visibility there, visibility there, and then the back content. So if we do nothing with this control, what we should end up seeing is we should end up seeing the um, the animations uh, not trigger. And so let's just turn off transitions really quick. And I think think what we want to do is I, I think I want to come down here and I want to do uh, visibility collapsed just straight up. Okay. And so let's go change the demo app real quick so we can test this. And then uh, cards, that's right. Because we should be able to just duplicate this guy. Flipper. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see, which one do we want to pick on first? Uh, let's see here. Why did this thing not wrap? I kind of, I kind of want to wrap it. It's in a wrap panel. Why is the wrap panel allowed to size out like this? Oh, because it's got a scroll viewer around it now. That's what happened. It isn't a wrap panel, but it is scrollable. That's interesting. Uh, hang on one second. I think we left ourselves an out for this. I I think there is a. Do do. I think we left ourselves an attached property or similar where we could turn this off for particular ones. Scroll viewer. Horizontal visibility requirement. Yeah, this thing. This thingy right here. Um, so I think we can just fix this right now. Uh, if we go to main window view model. Uh, wrap panel. Yeah, so a the the wrap panel normally uh so if you think of it like a stack panel stack panel just you know keeps stacking either horizontally or vertically wrap panel when it gets to the end it wraps down to the next line which is very convenient the problem is in this case because the wrap panel is inside of a scroll viewer when the scroll viewer says okay wrap panel how big do you want to be the wrap panel goes well if i get to pick i'd like to be wide enough to ha handle all my content and the scroll viewer goes, you got it. It's like, man. The scroll viewer really should be saying, nah, you can only be this wide. And then the rat panel would go, okay, fine. But I want to be tall. And it would go, okay.
So, but because it's uh, allowed to scroll in both the horizontal and the vertical direction, it wraps, or in this case, does not wrap. Uh, okay, I was going here. Observable collection, get demo item. This is where I want to be. So I want to find the cards, chips, cards. Yeah, this guy here. So I would like to do something like this and like this. And then I would like to do horizontal scroll bar visibility requirement gets scroll bar visibility uh, disabled. I think that will do it. That should disable the scroll viewer. So when the wrap panel says, you know, I'd like to be 2,000 pixels wide, the scroll viewer goes, you can have 1,400. And it goes, well, fine. I'll put the extra, you know, I'll take that content and move it around. Oh, and if you don't uh, close the demo app. Yeah, 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 yeah. You failed to copy. I get it. I get it. I'm sorry. I left the app running. Okay. Cards. There we go. See? So now it now it wraps because we have explicitly disabled the horizontal scroll bar. But as we make our content wider or shorter, it wraps around. So very handy control for certain layouts. It's one of those, it seems more useful than I than I find that it is. Um like it, it is a very cool control that works exactly as described. I've just found that there's so many cases where it's like that's close to what I want, but not quite what I want. So it's great if it's what you want. Okay, so we want to, we're gonna just double up. I, I, I think, let's just pick on the hard hard mode one here and we'll just grab the resizing flipper. And that, if, if we get that one working, the rest of it's gravy at that point. Um, uh, let's see, did I, did I not, oh, there's the cards. Uh, okay, so here is the flipper that does the resizing. And we're going to go here. I'm just going to duplicate this guy. And we need to give the um, the key here something unique. Uh, about flipper one. There. As long as the unique key is unique, doesn't matter what it is. Okay, so this is going to be flipper new. And then we're going to have to change all of these things to flipper new. And then this goes to be flipper new. And then do we get them all? I think we got them all. Great. Okay, let's just make sure we're rendering. Now, what we should see here with no changes is just a hard switch. Start simple. Start simple. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna get I'm gonna be launching this demo app enough. Let's nope, nope, not what I meant to do. Uh let's just change it so it auto launches into the uh the cards screen. Uh there. So we have programmed up our launch settings such that if you pass command line args, uh it will automatically jump to a picture of the thing. See? Look at this. See? Front content property was already registered with Flipper. This is a perfect example of where I did not get them all caught. And now my comment earlier about, hey, I think I left some bugs in there. Yeah. Uh, I left some bugs in there. Uh, so let's go through and fix all these. Actually, let's let's be let's be slightly smarter than my usual level. Um, there, that'll save a little typing. And now we're just going to, uh, I'm going to just do flipper here so I can see them all highlighted and we're just going to scroll real quick and see if we missed anything of importance. See, we missed one. See, we missed one. There we go. Okay. Relaunch. Never underestimate the power of find and replace, especially when regex can be involved. Okay, 
flipper target type does not match type of target element new. See, now we're making good progress. Now we're making good progress. So that tells me that down here, uh, I probably, yeah, I assigned a style that is just plain stupid. Uh, so, come up here. What did we call this? Uh, we just tacked a new one to the end. So we're going to come back over to the... Uh, close you don't care about you we're gonna come over here and say you know what we should probably only assign styles that match the control type that makes sense that's why we get kind of these rudimentary bugs out so basic premise make it work make it right make it fast this is the make it work portion of the okay so this one's here i believe this one is our new one yeah and our entire clicky clicky doesn't even work. Great. That's not quite what we were going for. But you know what? It, it's progress. And I wonder if I know why. Um, I wonder if it is the... So... I love material design. Excellent! That is what I like to hear. That looks so good. Well, and hopefully it's going to look better. Hopefully this font stops looking like crap soon. That That is our end goal, is font doesn't look like crap, and this thing actually like respects theming changes. So, because you can see here, see this one? It respected the theming change. And the only reason it did that is because we stopped putting it inside of a visual brush. So, who would have thunk? Uh, you don't put it in a visual brush and it behaves like it's supposed to. Uh, uh, I have a material design I'm doing with, uh, KivMD, uh, I'm working on slowly. I'm not entirely sure I, I know what that KivMD word is. I might need an explanation. Okay, so this got us to here, this got us to here, that much all works. Now the question is, why why does this thing show in a disabled state and not clickable? Uh, ah, a library uses Python. Oh, cool. Very cool. Um, so the, the first question then is, why are we in a disabled state and unable to, to click? So let's first identify where we expect it to work, and then we'll work backwards from there. Um, so I'm going to go with this flip command is the most likely explanation. And when routed commands, um, when their can execute returns false, or they fail to find a command binding, those are the two cases where they uh, will fall apart. And I am willing to bet that that means that the bug is not here, but is instead inside of this one. Yeah, so this one is using the old flipper flip command. We just need to update it so it uses the correct flip command. And that will probably fix it because the flipper itself with routed commands, so it registers up and says, this is a command that's going to be a thing. And then somebody has to do a command binding to handle it. And in this case, the flipper is saying, I'm going to handle it myself. Inside of your content, you can use this command, and as long as I'm a parent, I'll end up handling it. Uh, uh, same thing as this, but with Python. Oh, cool. So I love I found this. Need to learn a different language. Uh, how well does Copilot work with WPF? Shockingly good. Uh, I Well, and I'll put it this way. I don't think Copilot's great at WPF. I think Copilot's really great at looking at my repo and inferring intent. So I don't know if it's necessarily good at WPF as much as this is a fairly well-structured repo with a lot of repetition and Copilot goes, I got the pattern. I got this. And then it goes to town. I'm thinking it's more, more in that area. Because it, it quickly finds patterns really, really fast. Um... Yeah, and there's I, I've also got Copilot Chat installed, and we may leverage it at some point here because it, I've slowly been using it more and more. A lot of times it's just laughably bad. Uh, other times it is shockingly good. 
Uh, I develop a lot of, of GPT and use a lot of ChatGPT Alpha. Oh, nice. Yeah. Like it, it is, it is remarkably good. And I think the key thing is people re figuring out and realizing it is a tool. How do I use the tool effectively? Okay, so it flipped and then completely vanished. Not quite working yet. So I think we can agree that is not the right behavior. So something is off in our front back setup and it is almost assuredly right there. And let's try this one more time. Because we moved the, um, the state transitions to targeting the cards rather than the content presenter. So I'm willing to bet the card was shown, but then there was no content. So it just collapsed in on itself. That's my working theory. Theory seems to hold. And you note that there is a bit of a delay there where it's just hard swapping. Um, that is only there because it is using the transitions. And the, the transitions are currently animating, but then doing the, the hard swap. So I think this is good. I think what I'd rather see is it vanish immediately, wait for a second, and then the new one reappear. Specifically because our end goal will be during that vanish period, we want this plain 3D to do that kind of, I'm going to call it a door swing, right? It's the, it's, it's the door slam, the thunk goes better if you make make sound effects with it um because that delay is coming from uh let's see here these guys in here actually where is the delay coming from i would have thought the delay was coming from inside of these transitions but those are all commented out so it must be inside of here or here when this command fires uh, set current value is flipped. Uh, is it possible to see the repo code? Uh, I see by learning desire. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, repo lives here. Uh, if you want a kind of a brief tour of kind of where things are at, uh, the UWP folder is largely dead. You can disregard it. Uh, same with the demo up here. Um, the, the more interesting ones are the, the two demo apps. The one shows off material design two, which is the one I'm running now, but there is a material design three demo as well. The prime library lives in the material design themes WPF. Um, and it is supported by the material design colors WPF one. All of the Ma app stuff is a, um, call it a, a linking library merging library uh, for people who want to use Ma apps with their WPF because Ma apps offers a lot of nice functionality such as like window chroming that some people really like. So if you want that, there is a nice integration there. And then the rest of this is all around tests. So if you got specific questions, feel free to ask. Always happy to go into them. Um, and yeah. So hopefully that is helpful. I will say, I think the library, this library, I feel is in a pretty good state, especially given how few people um, are consistent contributors. But it, I, over the years, like I'm not the original author, but I am the current maintainer. And it, it just slowly been working it towards nice. Uh, yeah, I'm not good at tests. How do we add tests without adding complexity into a code base or is that impossible? Ah, um, I think it depends. So testing a theme library or anything UI related is kind of inherently difficult because oftentimes the test that you want to write is does this look right? And it's really hard to know does this look right? Like oftentimes when people do UI tests, they test like the structure of the UI but that, that doesn't guarantee you that the structure yields the right visual appearance that you're going for. Um, the, the key test that this library has is really around testing the behavior of the controls. Um, I don't know if I would tell you to model your stuff after this. Because there was not a good UI testing library for testing the theming of WPF, most people say, oh, you just write UI tests. Well, UI tests are only really good for apps, not for testing like theming libraries. So 
I went off the deep end and I built a testing framework specifically for this library. So there's that because I, and part of it was, is I didn't want to add a lot of complexity. Um, here, just brief example. We'll pick on like, Ooh, do we have any flipper? We have flipper tests. Hey, look at this. You see, we have flipper tests, All right? So the, the idea here was I wanted simple tests. So I want to be able to feed in a, a chunk of XAML, right? And this is kind of big and probably should have been split onto multiple lines, but whatever. Um, I want to be able to pull some things out. And at the end of the day, a lot of what I test is the behavior of the controls because it's really hard to know, do, does this look right? is a visual check, which is part of why we have the demo apps, because oftentimes that's how I'm checking things is I just run through the pages in the demo app and go, yep, that looks right. That looks right. And then I've got tests to make sure the behavior um, goes through and does it. Um, yeah, there's I I hunted around before I spent a bunch of time building a a testing framework for XAML because I I was acutely aware of how big that was going to go. Um, and it, yeah, there, I, there's a few things I, I kind of would like to change to give it some better interop between other things, but a lot of stuff just didn't work right. Uh, can this also go to Android? Uh, currently no, right now it's specifically targeting WPF, which is ye olde desktop platform for windows, um, which will probably never go cross plat. Um, the, uh, Everything that Microsoft's doing for cross-plat is going to be focused on .NET MAUI, which under the hood uses WinUI 3 for their Windows port. So if this thing were going to go to Android, it would probably go in the form of styles for MAUI. And I have been fiddling around with MAUI for a personal application. And like MAUI is really cool. And there's a lot that really makes it feel rough around the edges. So, for example, earlier, um, I just wanted, I, I wanted to write a quick unit test. And just setting up the unit test project to target the MAUI app project was a major pain. And it, things like that just make it feel, something feels off. So as soon as I get the app into a state where I feel like I've got it structured the way I like, I'm probably adding it to my templates repository. Um, Maybe I could code it for Android. Yeah, though, so it took a little bit on Android, though, is the material design was inherently built for Android by Google. Like, that, it's their design paradigm. So, to some degree, Android already has it built in. It kind of lacks, in like, there's differences. And this library has to make some decisions around... When, because uh, the material design spec, uh, do, 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 like it's very good, but if we go and look at components and like something simple like a button, right? Um, it will outline very specifically the 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 structure and how these buttons should look, but the problem is, is it it runs when you're building it for WPF this only covers some controls and there's a set of controls or components as, as they call it here and there's a set of controls in WPF and they don't match up one to one and so there's a lot of this where in in my library we kind of make judgment calls because it's like I I don't know they didn't leave a spec for a WPF data grid like eh so we you we use it this as a guide and then make a best guess and go probably close enough um and where and where it's really off like we try to leave enough extensibility to where people can tweak things because even if we implement the material design spec perfectly the material design spec is a lot of guidelines not necessarily hard and fast rules in some cases and so and, and at the end of the day people want to build the apps the way they want and so they will some people will follow this very religiously. Other people are like, yeah, I just want bits of it. Okay, great. To each his own. Uh, okay. So I still didn't find where the delay was occurring. So 
We saw the on flipped is occurring. We know that there's the event. This goes through here. This raises the event. Oh yeah, no problem. Thank you for the questions. I always, I enjoy them. So some people get weirded out. They're like, oh, I'm sorry for making you rabbit trail. I'm like, I don't mind rabbit trail. I love that stuff. Uh, okay, so update visual state. This makes sense. This is what's triggering the visual state manager in the XAML. So when the is flipped property toggles, this guy here looks at the value here and goes, well, am I flipped or am I unflipped? Okay, great. And it picks one and toggles back and forth. Um, this does a remeasure, which we've completely commented out, so we can concur that's doing uh, nada. This guy then gets invoked, which raises the event, which pretty much does nothing, but it's formatted a little weird, so we're going to clean that up because I don't like that. Um, why do we have a routed property changed event args? Oh, I see. Because the old value coming in is WPF. This is this is another area of WPF that bites people a lot. Is WPF came out um, right around the same time generics were being added into C sharp, but that means WPF was developed pre C sharp generics, and so a lot of APIs in WPF that we wish were generic that probably would have been if it had been built, you know, a couple years later are not. It's very disappointing. Um, and they have strong risk aversion to ever implementing a breaking change. And so, so that's part of where I don't expect certain things to ever uh, fully change. So where is this delay? I would have expected, I would have expected this to just automatically, let's go false here and make sure, because I'm wondering if it's doing an Im implicit thing on me. Because we aren't adding any delay on these uh i wonder if there's a default setup here that i'm just unaware of it would not shock me to know that when use state transitions is true there's some yeah there's a delay there i don't know where the delay is um okay uh let's see uh, this guy here should have a time on him. The key time, is that what it is? Uh, key time of zero. Like, do it immediately, right? Don't think, just go. Because the idea with these storyboards here is that they really should be, uh, actually, I think you can also just do duration zero. I remember right is another we're gonna do them both and see what happens um because i what i really want to see is that visibility just like toggle immediately on click like i shouldn't be seeing that ripple animation or any of that it's just because whoop, whoop. it clearly knows the desired state and then we've told it like we've taken away all the transitions so there shouldn't be anything there uh is the wpf code uh public open source uh it there we go yep so that was the problem there is a default the, i'm guessing the duration is being inferred and in inference dumb i'm gonna kill the key times real quick and see because i think storyboard duration zero will force these immediate and then i don't have to worry about it we're just gonna test this real quick uh yes wpf code is open source um i will warn you uh, Tharby Dragons. Tharby Serious Dragons. I do have this cloned locally. There is some... Just to get it to compile, there's some really fun dependencies you're going to run into. I believe Perl is a dependency. Which is weird. Again, remember, when this was built, like... the the. WPF is closing in on two decades of age. So just to be clear, it's stable because it's had two decades to stabilize. But it's the best tech from like 2005. So take that with a grain of salt. But yeah, and there's various people who have talked about updating WPF. And to some degree, like 
Microsoft has tried multiple times. Like they they did uh, uh, Metro apps, which turned into UWP, uh, Universal Windows Platform, which were both very similar to WPF. They have a very similar XAML front end. There's actually a when we when we talk about XAML versions, you'll note 2006 right here. There's a, there's a 2009 I think is the the later spec, and it's the one I believe that Maui uses that adds in support for things like generics and some common stuff like arrays that you would just kind of expect. The um, the the, even though it has that similar feel with the XAML and the C-sharp for building the app, it's uh, an updated runtime because some of the, the limitations of WPF are the um, tight coupling to like DirectX for how it does its rendering, which is why most people will say, oh, don't build games in WPF because it can't handle it, blah, 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 whatever, right? If you are building a game where you want high FPS, yes, it is probably not the right thing. You should probably build on a game engine or something with like physics and whatnot built in because WPF gives you none of that. But if you just want to build like a card game app, yeah, go up, go for it. Like, you're fine. You don't you don't need a physics engine like you don't like pick a framework that that works and makes you happy like i've built multiple games i build minesweeper and wpf all the time because i enjoy minesweeper and i think it's fun um and it's not a terribly difficult thing to build and you it works just fine in wpf so it depending on what you're building um but the uwp and win ui they do update their rendering so that they can get better um better rendering like th there's this kind of thing here and i don't know if it's showing up very well on my screen where they have the concept of um being able to do like that acrylic where you can kind of see through the app that's something that wpf doesn't have because that's very much newer windows rendering stuff and so you're only going to get that on like a win ui type application people have tried to simulate it with wpf it's not easy it's very difficult there's also security concerns, all that jazz. Um, but those are the types of things that kind of, like that's that's really what you gain by switching to these newer frameworks. The, the big disadvantage in my mind is because of WPF's age, there's a lot of tooling and a lot of support for WPF. And like you can find blog posts from 2007 that are still applicable today, which is great. Like, there's a lot of useful stuff out there. There's also some garbage, but that comes with every framework. Okay, so now we would like to make a transition happen. Okay, so now we're going to make this, now, now we're going to do the fun thing. So, this guy here, when we trigger, actually, let's, let's, let's do one more thing. So this is, this is with state transition false. Um, let's, let's just test one more thing. That was state transition false. We're gonna set this back to true. And I, I should, I should still get the exact same behavior here on these flips. Even with state transitions is true, because we have them commented out, there should be no state transition for it to match on. It should still automatically switch. But what I'd like to do is click it. Wait, where's my, huh? Where'd it go? What? Am I am I am I stupid? Is this it? Well, this is it. Wait a minute. Update visual states. With this false, it works. Oh, does it just not trigger if it doesn't match on anything? Oh, that'd be horrible. I'm just surprised that it started in the flip state. It was very interesting. Wait, what? Huh? Whoa. Did I not test it with after I did this? Did I not, did I not test that? I'm, I'm confused now. I've done something stupid. 
and I don't see my mistake yet. Maybe I should be committing as I go so I can see my mistakes easier. That's probably a good idea. We'll, we'll do a commit once we get this working. Oh, interesting. The key time is relevant. Okay. 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 Bear cop. Uh, let's go. Let's go. Let's go back here then. And then we'll leave that as is. But I want to flip this back to true. Actually, we're going to leave this. No, what we're going to do is we're going to make a commit. Uh, create branch. Flipper take two. That sounds like a great, a great name for the moment. Stage. Uh, starting work on new flipper idea. And then commit push. Oh, I really should drag it over. Hang on, hang on. I'm going to back this up. So, oh, I can't. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I can show this off. I can show this off. Just got to get my big head out of the way. Okay, so uh, reset mixed. Okay, so I've got work in progress changes. I've just created a branch. Everyone's happy. Normally, you'd go through and review your changes, but yeah, whatever. Uh, we come down here and we go, you know, uh, starting work on new flipper design. And then one of my new favorite buttons on Get Kraken. See? Little, little arrow down here. Whoop. We go click and commit and push. And mwah. And that little prompt up there is just because I hadn't pushed to a remote yet, so there was no remote branch. Future commits, it won't even do that. It just push, push. Because so often you go commit and then push. And now it's all down there. And that is a split button, which we just recently got added to the library. Thank you, Nikolai. Um, okay. Okay, so now we're going to make this guy true. And I want to confirm that when I hit this, I get the exact same behavior as what I did before. Because setting, when you call the Visual State Manager go to state, the use transition property being true should only have an effect if it can find a transition for the, the state that it's going to. So it should, yeah, perfect. Okay, works as expected, world's a happy place. Okay. Now, what we are going to do is we are going to turn on transitions, and we have multiple visual states of flipped and unflipped. And so as we define these visual states, things should now work. So we're going to come down here, and we're going to turn these guys on. And we need to change a couple things. So first of all, uh, back content presenter needs to become part back content. Those are fine. And then front content presenter comes here, comes here, great. Um, okay, so now we have to get our transition to occur. So the key part here is this transition is going to take four tenths of a second. All right, so we, we have all of these things here of what we are going to uh, to change. So we've told here is the, the time, All right? So this is a double animation using keyframes. We tell it the total duration is four tenths of a second. And so it's going to basically do a timeline from zero to four tenths. And at zero, the value that's being assigned to rotation Y will be zero. At two tenths of a second, the value of rotation Y will be assigned to 90 degrees. It will then assign it to negative 90 instantaneously. This is important. This is how it does the, the switch. So it goes up to 90, right? And the reason we have to do this is because in order for the um, animation to work, it does what's called tweening or in-betweening, where it then calculates a number of values between 0 and 90 during this duration. Because, you know, you can kind of just draw a straight line, but this easing function uh, controls how you get from point A to point B, right? Sometimes you want a nice rounded curve. Sometimes you want to do a little logarithmic thing or whatever, right? Easing functions are how you shape your line, but the, the whole point is we're calculating values. But then as soon as we get to 90, we immediately flip to negative 90 because we want to spin now the other way, do the other half of the door spin. And so from two to four, we then go back to zero. So this will then calculate values from negative 90 also going forward to zero. Uh, 
Uh, I wonder why do we need to use WPF in 2023 when we have Avalonia? That is a that is a fair point. Um, Avalonia is actually scheduled. Um, I plan on doing some streams on it uh, early next year. Um, because it is getting quite popular. I think the big thing is there are still plenty of enterprise customers that don't trust things that aren't backed by companies as big as Microsoft. Like Avalonia does have a nice, um, uh, uh, if you, for bigger companies, you know, they could pay to get uh, uh, support for it, which I think mitigates a lot of the, the risk factor that people have. Um, but I think there, there is still a little bit of that fear of, oh, this isn't first party or, or similar. And honestly, some people would say, why use WPF when we've got WinUI, when we've got web, when we've got other stuff. Um, and I think it kind of depends on what you're building. There's still, there's still a lot of legacy code bases that, um, that leverage a lot of it, but I don't know if that. Even then, I still occasionally will will use it for for new projects. But depending on what a customer is doing, I don't know if it's necessarily my first tool that I reach for. Uh, yeah, and that's one of the the conversion tool that Avalone has. That's one of the things that really interests me the most because they use the the newer XAML syntax, which is which is pretty slick. Um, yeah, 20 years old and has a stable SP1. <laughs> yes, we call them financial institutions and governments. They upgrade with all the speed of molasses flowing uphill in the wintertime. But yeah, no, the I, I saw a demo of, of that uh, conversion tool and it really impressed me. So that's part of why I went through. Um, there's not a lot of content online that people have done on Avalonia, which is kind of disappointing because it does seem like it's fairly cool which is why i was going to do several streams on it and kind of dive into it and take a look um there is i will say this the, um the some of the people from the avalonia team actually uh ported this library over to avalonia so if you like this material design library it's over there as well i i don't think they've like tried to ingest a lot of them like my breaking 5.0 changes but they at least ported everything that was there and brought it over so that there is now a nice material designy theme for it so if you like this look and you like avalonia it is there as well i can't say i had anything to do with it um but i mean they forked and opened or i don't know if they even forked i don't know if it even shows up as a fork they might have just cloned and pushed somewhere else but regardless uh i went looked at the code base and was laughing because there were some of my comments <laughs> that i'd left years ago i'm like ah i know where the source of this came from so whether I, I whether they did it as a you know a clone and copy and change stuff or whether you know they took just took inspiration as they went either way props to them it looks cool um okay so uh animations here so the first thing here when we go from flipped to unflipped so Oh no, unflipped. So unflipped is front showing. We want to immediately hide the front content on site because we're going to do an animation. And we want to wait to show the back content until the animation completes. So we're going to flip those around. And I think we want to do the, the same here. So when we go to flipped, the back content should immediately go to collapsed. And the front content should become visible at the end of the animation. And then the whole thing in here is going to be the the rotation. And then I think what we're going to do is we're going to go and create a couple properties on our our plane 3D because I I want to I want to basically here's here's what I what I kind of want to do. I'm going to write the code that I want and then we're going to go make it work. Um so up here I would like to do something like this where I target Part plane 3D, and I want to target, um, I don't know, starting content uh, and discrete object using keyframes. And I would like this value here. Well, I guess I can't bind the content, can I? Because what I really want to put here is a binding. Because what I really want to do is binding element name. Uh, Part front, 
And then I kind of want to do... Oop, nope, not that. And then I want to do... Oh, I guess I need to duplicate the whole storyboard, don't I? Or the, the object keyframe. And then I want to do something like ending content. Um, and I want it to be part back content. Like, I want to do something like this. I don't think I can get away with this. Can I? I don't think value is a... Oh, it is a dependency property. Well, now. Well, now, well, now, well, now. Okay, we're going to do this. So I think this is what I want. That way, as soon as the storyboard starts, it's going to get a reference to each of those things. It can do the visual brush. It can do the transition. And then they go away. That's the important part. And we could clear them if we wanted. We could clear them if we wanted at the end. Right, like we could come in here and we could say at four, uh, set this guy back to null. We could do this guy up here. That way there's no, no lingering references between those two things. Yeah, I think I th I think we're gonna try this. This is this is this is the idea that I think works, but I'm not real confident. So in this case, all we're gonna do is we're gonna flip the order of these two guys, and then we go here, and I go that, and something like that. So the important things here is now I need starting and ending content to exist. And I need to update the plain 3D to have all of this. The other thing that we are missing is I need to have him become visible. Because we don't we don't have him becoming visible yet. So let's do that. Um, target property ability. Uh the bill is T, spelling counts, because um, we basically want to do this same maneuver here. Actually, we just, we actually, I should have just stolen this whole thing, because this is more or less what I want. Um, so I want this, but I want it to start at zero, and then I want it to go to collapsed afterwards. So he's going to do his animation, he's going to collapse, he's going to go away, and no one's going to be the wiser. Just going to work. It's just going to work. Um, and then we want the same thing down here. See? See, this, like, thank you, Copilot. You're close. What's the next line? See? There you go. Perfect. Does Copilot know WPI? Oh, hang on. It's a moron. Did I mess it up above? Is it just see it's see it's not smart enough to know that I'm an idiot. But it's smart enough to copy my idiocy. Um Okay, so that gets us that gets us two storyboards and we just need to implement starting and ending content as properties on our new plane 3D and have it use it instead of this stuff that it's doing. All right, cuz it's doing a ton of things in here that and then it's doing this measure and arrange stuff, and we can probably we're, we're probably going to be able to whack a lot of that. So that that's that's the game plan. Okay, so come up here, uh, prop uh, dependency, and we're going to go with um, let's do framework element. I think so. Starting uh, content. And then we just have to fix this to be uh, plain 3D new. And this should probably have been declared nullable because I'm an idiot. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. That'll work. Uh, no, that's not what I wanted. Yeah, that's what I wanted. Do it. Yeah, thanks. Don't ask. Uh, okay. Probably should have done that after I do the second one because I'm going to end up doing it a second time. We're going to do framework element question mark. Stop it. And then we're going to change this to be, uh, wait, we called it ending content. Right? 
that was what it was what uh, what did I call this ending content starting content okay uh, let's see plain 3d new default value null if a template doesn't know any better I really should write my own okay that they annoy me enough that uh, I wish there was a way to say I, like I don't just go I want I want go I don't want you to think okay and yeah name of and all that kind of stuff we'll clean that up later right now we're looking to make this just work okay so that goes there and we are looking to have this guy get set so previously it was using this child property and it was doing remove visual child move logical child and it was doing work hey yo 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 welcome everybody we are we are attempting to build a new flipper control one that doesn't suck or at least that's the, that is the goal and i am only stalling for time for a moment and then i will show you what that is so hopefully people like the idea you just dereferenced a null point <laughs> uh love it so uh this is what a flipper is and it goes flippy flippy like a like a fish which is very exciting if you like fish um but you'll note this thing's text looks all blurry and yucky uh this side's text looks pretty and nice we want this side to do the pretty flippy flippy animation and not have like the the crap stuff here so that's what we're going for that's the goal at the moment you can see we made it we made it change states yeah yeah not nearly as cool as uh and you can see the sizing's off and i'll we'll have to figure out that but next up animation and woo transitions parallax view i think is the what the cool kids are calling it but i don't know if i'm young enough to use that that word so but i mean that was the word back in 2007 and i am old enough to reference that so that works uh so at present though we are attempting to refactor this this plain 3d class because it is what was doing the animation on the old class but it does it by leveraging a a visual brush and this create visual child garbage and this is what we don't like because it does all kinds of weird stuff and this code is kind of ugly and so we're gonna we're gonna clean this up a little and see if we can get it straightened out and then i think it will work at least that's that's the goal we'll see how how well that that actually plays out in real life um okay i don't think we need any of this garbage because frankly we aren't trying to measure this thing anymore uh since we want to align with it we might still need to do some of it for for the moment we're just going to whack it all um layout invalidated cacher this what is this thing down here doing this thing is literally overriding well this is a this is a a problem because we copied and pasted the control and renamed it um and so we need something more akin to this more something akin to this let's see planar plain planar planar nader or whatever we call this the uh for for those wanting to read the the ancient text of the animations because i i pl pl planarator i i don't know yeah but i don't know if layout invalidations are going to matter for us at all because the whole point in doing it this way is we don't want to try to deal with that crap we want to snapshot and be done um uh front material is interactive back material is not that is going to become a lie so this guy builds up creates a visual child adds the visual child 
adds the logical child. The logical tile wraps the original child, which is the one that was passed in here. Yuck. And then it validates its measure all to come in here and figure out the appropriate size of this stuff. That is all interesting and exciting, and none of it shows me where the actual rendering occurs. So I would like to find that. So arrange, update 3D, uh, does the lion's share of the work, it looks like. So the whole point here is on update 3D. We come in, it does math on the field of view, updates the scaling and rotation, adjusts the y-axis, and basically shifts the perspective camera uh, around from wherever it needs to be. Interesting. Is this thing immutable? It looks like that is the case. Okay. Interesting. Field of view is a double. Interesting. Okay. Um, I am going to pretend like that makes sense and roll with it because that is useful, I guess. Um, okay. So the important parts for us then is when these properties that we've just added change, we want to... Oh, and I guess we did these out of make this not look weird. Nope. I'm getting purple underlines. Am I debugging still? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, weird, because my play button was still there. Okay. So when these guys change, we are going to need to do some sort of update to this, because when the rotation X and Y properties change, it's calling update rotation here and the rotation y property is absolutely going to be updated as part of our animation storyboard because that's what will make the flip occur so i'm thinking that we need something that triggers this create visual um i don't think we care about the child as much. But I'm trying to figure out where it pulls front and back from when it's doing this work. How did the old one switch the two content as it was transitioning? That's what I that's what I'm trying to understand because this only has a single child coming in. Uh, if we go and look, the previous flipper, the one right next door, do it has front and back content, which is great. Uh, let's take a look at how did your front and back content make it into the plane 3D is the question. There's your plane 3D. That goes there, that goes there. This invalidates measurement, which is fine. But I don't see where that gets the front and back content in. So it must be buried inside of the style. So let's go and take a look. So this one here, they have a single child, which is a grid, so that child element will be this guy here that's passed in and inside of it it has front and back content oh interesting so it doesn't actually have the concept of front and back what it has is a single element and it's toggling the visibility of its uh because these two things these two content presenters share a grid and so all it's doing is uh, hiding and showing the content inside the grid, which is why it cares about like invalidating and remeasuring itself because it's not swapping between two bits of content partway through. It only has the one content and it is updating that content on the fly. That's interesting.
So, okay, okay, I'm with you now. I'm with you. So, let's see here. Logical child comes into here, back material. Where does back material show up? So, this is the back model. I'm thinking what we need to do is we need to just go through and grab a second visual brush in here somewhere. Because I'm imagining one of these is going to get used in two places. Um, the back model ends up there. Front model. Got it. Okay, so the interactive front side. So there is... The front side and this viewport is what has two things in it um the this guy here so this one is ultimately what contains our back model which comes from this model 3d group which gets its children which has a back model here which has a back material. The back material has a visual brush, and the visual brush is being pointed at logical child, which is unfortunate. I think this is what needs to be a back item or ending item. I think goes here. Let's actually just bookmark that real quick. Um, and then for the front item, I think it's coming from here. I think this front item is grabbing logical child a second time here and i think front item i think is what needs that i think that's that that working theory so if we go with as stupid simple as we can make this we go with um ending content uh here and we go with starting content here and this will build all of this up and i i think what we need to do is uh if starting content uh is and we're gonna do uh how about is not uh, not null. I know this is gonna look weird, so bear with me for for a moment. And ending content is not boom. Copilot, you're doing so good. You're doing so good. Uh, return. And I think what we need is this guy's called here. We aren't gonna be invoking him anymore. And he was previously setting up a visual child. I don't think I need him returning anything anymore. Is he's returning a field that he's already holding on to, so that's not necessary. Uh, how about setup mm, visual elements, something to that effect, and then down here, we're just gonna hold on to that guy, and then up here, we're gonna use this guy. So this does a a null check, and if they, well, hold on, if starting content is not null. Is not not null. Wow, this is this is okay. We're gonna do this. That. There we go. Okay, that makes me feel better. Um that I can read. So if starting content is not null and ending content is not null, then we will go through and do this. That way we can have our property changes on these guys up here. Um, we can do now, just like the other ones are doing, uh, D uh, args lambda on the property change. We basically want this, this whole ugly thing here. This goes like this. And we do the name of the method that I didn't just forget that I wrote only two seconds ago uh, goes here. And boop, that goes there. Okay. 
the line is long, the line is ugly. We'll wrap it to make it not quite as ugly, and that way my big head doesn't get in the way. Okay, so on the assignments from the storyboard, it's going to set both of these property. Whichever one goes through first, only one of these will be set, so it won't matter. Um, I think what we should do down here is an else case um, to do, you know, clean up. Like if one, as soon as one of these things goes to null, we should probably be clearing out like the viewport and that kind of thing and all of that jazz. So we'll, we'll deal with that in a moment. Okay. This caching is nice and we will keep all of this, but I think... So we're going to do this. We're going to whack all this. And I think now I can get rid of the original child is clearly dead. Logical and visual child hopefully are dead. And if they aren't, we should probably kill their usages. Okay, so where are you still used? Size, arrange. There, he's, it's manually calling a range on both of these. And this is an early exit. Um, I don't know if I care about any of this. Uh, get visual child count. I think we don't care about that anymore. Uh, visual child count. I don't think we care about that anymore because he's not going to have any visual children. At the end of the day, we want WPF to treat this as just a regular element and size it appropriately for it. Like we don't want to be doing measurement and children counts and all that stuff. Okay, get descendant bounds. Um, whereas descendant bounds is tighter. Uh, okay, so this now is interesting because this is wanting to know how tight to do this. And the only way we get this is where are you invoked from? So field of view. Okay, and the other one is the one we just saw on the arrange override. I think what we I think we can do a similar check as to what we did earlier of if uh actually you know we could do if viewport well let's just do that if viewport is So there's there's a subtle trick that's being applied here um, that I don't know if it's always obvious to people. Part of the advantage of doing um, null checks and pattern matching into local variables is that local variables inside a function are thread safe by definition. So it is it is impossible for a variable that is scoped inside of a function. I should say possible. No, possible um, to be changed from multiple threads. So by Capturing this in a uh, local variable, it is impossible for anything else to muck with it. Now, we are doing UI work, and it's uh, typically you're guarded against needing to think about multi-threading in UI work uh, simply by virtue of uh, if there is not, uh, or UI objects can only be touched from the UI thread itself. So it's not usually a big issue. Okay, we'll make you static. Thank you. Um, we still have to figure out where to get the descendant bounds from. And so this is actually going to be the bounds. Hmm. This is actually going to be the bounds of the starting content. Because in, in all cases, the starting content is going to be where the control is. And it was using the logical child before. Um, and so now we don't have to null check this stuff because there was a null bang in here. So we just, we're not going to, we're not going to deal with that problem. Um, because it always started with the starting content. And then be, by using logical child, it, the, the visibility of the child and thus its size would change partway through here. And so this is looking to, this is probably going to be wrong halfway through the animation, but good enough to get started. 
Okay, let's see if this does anything. I will be tickled to death if it works first time. And also, completely and utterly terrified. If your code works the first time, you should question your sanity. Unless you wrote a lot of tests or something. Then, then, then maybe it's okay. Okay. I mean, it, it did a thing. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this for a moment so I, just so I get a little less bouncing. The wrap panel is being kind of annoying in terms of sizing of this. So those are hiding. Hmm. That is probably problematic that the sizing is changing. It, it, it's sizing to zero which I think is probably what's biting us. Let's just fix its size real quick so that it, and by fix, I mean hard code its size so that it doesn't move around on us. Uh, let's see, Snoop, uh, come in here. I want to grab the flipper new. Actual height is 250 or 200 by 256. Great. So we're going to do width or, nope. Nope, that's with, oh, wow. I don't know why the focus is moving into there. That's horrible. Uh, height, okay, so I want the width to be set to 200. I want the height to be set to 256. There, now it shouldn't bounce. Okay. Not pretty, but it's but it's at least now fixed in size and not moving around on me. Okay, so now the the question comes. I would like to look at the plain three D as it is doing stuff, and let's pay attention. So it yeah, so it's been sized down to zero. which is an interesting problem i think us going to collapse rather than hidden is problematic on our content and i think our style might need to make them hidden so that the size stays there but even without doing that this thing didn't size the way I would have expected. So uh, uh, horizontal alignment is set to stretch, but it did not get itself bigger. It's still sized to zero because it didn't think that it needed to measure anything. So that arrange code that I got rid of is probably problematic because before it was arranging itself and measuring itself and I think this is probably what needs to happen I mean let's let's just go in here and do the same thing right so if if this thing were to have the right sizes uh, 256 uh, by 200 all right, so we're gonna make we're gonna make him big for a moment and then bring this guy back. If we the flip this, we're still not getting any rendering on this. So I would like to look at rotation. So when we click this, we're gonna move this over a little bit. So I click so you can see all those values going through there so it's 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 getting all of them uh let's look at front uh oh no starting ending let's see here so ending content starting content make you a little bigger so i can see both 
Okay, so starting and ending content aren't getting set. That's part of the, so there's part of the problem right there. So starting and ending content aren't being set as part of the animation. Um, I am going to track that down first, I think. Let's check here. Cannot find governing element, binding expression. Nope, that's not us. That's trying to bind a solid color brush. Um, let's see here. Is there a binding error in here? Yeah, cannot find governing element. These guys here. I think this might be our guy. Discrete object keyframe. So that clever trick that I was surprised worked didn't work which not not terribly shocking um just means we have to approach this in a slightly different way okay okay we can we can work around this because worst case scenario we have to do an attached property but we can make this work because in general to be able to bind on a storyboard your storyboard typically acts on a fixed property and your binding goes elsewhere so what what probably is going to need to happen is in the interest of making this work so let's let's do this get rid of these for the moment get rid of these and what we are going to do is we're going to come down here and we're going to bind uh oh hang on dang nab you co-pilot you show off freaking show off no no i was uh, i'm sorry i'm sorry co-pilot thank you Woo! do the other one for me thanks okay um she's still a freaking show off oh uh, yes i know you you inferred what i wanted congratulations get yourself a cookie um, I think what we need to do here is this needs to go hidden. And then I think what should happen is on here, it should go collapsed. So start hidden. That way the flipper maintains the size of the control that was there. And then when the other one comes visible, then we'll, then we'll collapse it and let the other one's size take over. But I think this is actually what we want to do here is start off hidden because hidden and collapsed are very similar they both are not visible obviously um, but hidden maintains the space and collapse just goes to zero but in our case collapsing to zero is fine because the other one comes visible at the same time so then front content gets zeroed out back content then gets whatever size it wants to be so I think that gets, I think this fixes some of our sizing issues. This fixes the things always being null. And then let's see if we actually get an animation. Now it's obviously going to be wrong half the time. But that means it's also right half the time. So win. And it might not be that bad to have these things bound up. Because then it could... Um, hold on to them okay must disconnect uh, specified child from parent visual before attaching to a new oh well that's kind of dumb that's kind of dumb Um, I don't want to. I want to. I don't want to detach it. It kind of needs to stay there. So what do you what do you want here? So you want a visual, right? Um, and you you are not a vis visual. I don't think. No, you are not. So, I'm going to need to do something here to capture you. 
or I do nothing and we see if it works. I mean, it's obviously not going to work because I've now removed the assignment. But I kind of want to just see if I can get the animation going first. Because general premise, make it work, make it right, make it fast. And then we go from there. Okay, so here. Okay, one of these is, so going from front to back isn't, is losing the size completely still. Uh, let's see. So front to back is uh, unflipped to flipped. Uh, oh, this is happening too early. That's why. That's why it's doing that. Yeah, the other one I got right. That one I just got wrong. I'm sure you would have gotten it right, Copilot, and I just was too dumb to listen to you. It's okay. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. Okay. So, flip. Okay. No. No visuals. So, we're going to need to do something here. To clone this. What is the easiest way to get this? Because I think what we want to do is wrap it up in a visual brush. Right? So I, I, I think we want to do something like this, where we do starting content. Uh, uh, front BB, sure, fine, whatever. Um, and then I think we want to go here, but that's not going to work. So I'm going to need to put it into something is the problem. And I'm going to need to put it into something that then sizes to the something. Hmm. I don't know the right... I don't know the right thing to apply to this. Because you could do something simple where we do like... Um, I think you can do new... Is visual abstract... Can't remember. You abstract. Yeah, you are. Um, I mean, we could do something like rectangle. Uh, right. Now we do something like that, and then we set the the fill to the. Uh, like you can do something like that. I don't know if this is going to size properly, though, and this is now because because I'm wanting to put a visual element inside of it, but I, I kind of want to clone it. I'm also tempted to go look at the Snoop code base to see how they do it. So something is still not still not landing. Let's let's just confirm that a we're getting into here to begin with. Oh, we probably have to restart because now that we're binding directly, we will only hit this once. Oh, that's actually probably also problematic. Um, but we are coming through here. We are building this up. Huzzah, huzzah, huzzah. Uh, I don't know what I'm looking for on this, so we're just going to move on. Uh, this indent is giving me hives. And then you can do that, sure. Does fancy maths. Okay, and then if we come over down well let's let's just look at it in Snoop, because I think that was the most telling before. So let's come here. Come here. Come here. Target that. So for people new to Snoop, uh if you hover your cursor over the um, the element that you want to inspect and or snoop, the hint was in the name, the, you can then, it'll adjust your visual tree to that particular element and then you can navigate from there. Oh, that's right. We have a height width problem here, don't we? So height, we want 256 and we want the width 
to be 200. We probably there probably needs to be something there. I like the timing of that. That looks better. Uh, let's see here. Let's check out rotation. And let's check out... No. St st stop. I don't like... Whatever's making that thing jump down there. Um, I would like to then do... Starting. Ending. Okay, so both of those are set and have the appropriate values. And we're appropriately animating. I mean, appropriately, it's probably a stretch. Okay, so what if we messed up that this was previously doing that we've killed? That we've killed off the the children, which I believe is correct. Were we adding one of these in? So before the layout invalidation cacher was picking up original child and that was making it in. I don't think that's overly relevant. But I have been wrong in the past. It's calling invalidate measure, which was then going in here and previously was measuring based upon the child sizes. We may need to either handle this measurement in here based upon our starting and ending content. Or alternatively, we could just bind it in our style and handle it there, um, depending on how we want to do it. Like the, this plane 3D and the the flipper class are going to be tightly coupled. That, like you could almost embed one in the other. The arrange comes in here, and we we do call the update 3D. I believe. I mean, maybe we should maybe we should validate this gets pinged during the flip. Yes. It only is getting hit once, which I'm kind of surprised at. I thought the whole point was to update this field of view multiple times. So where's our call stack coming in from? Arrange override. You know, maybe it's worth looking at how often the other one gets hit because um, I sort of thought that that thing was hit a bunch, but let's let's test that theory. Um, so here's the original, and we've got it sitting right next door, so we can just click it. One hit came in from range override. Another hit, call stack came in from range override. Yeah, so that thing got pinged a bunch. So that arrange override is problematic. Okay, so what is making us be invalidated, I guess is the question. Um, one of these guys here is invalidating and causing measure passes and a range passes. So I guess maybe we should check on this to see what's triggering that. I don't see what is triggering that. And maybe I'm just an idiot. So we won't we won't eliminate that as a possibility. Did I turn off the wrong breakpoint? I wanted that one off. Oh, uh, yeah, the other one's on there. If I click this. Okay, but what is getting, what is making that change? Maybe I'm just missing as to how this is working. 
because this has resulted size. How often do you get pinged? Can't imagine it's that much, right? One, two, three, four. You're getting pinged a lot. Um, what is triggering this pass? Because this is the hard part. Is it's it's coming through the layout pass, but what is making this thing want to relay itself out? Oh, is it the property change? I wonder, I wonder if that's that, okay, 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 theory, theory. Okay, so the issue is we should be getting, we should be getting pinged and measured a ton. All right, so we're going to uncomment this, and but instead comment the contents. All right, because we think we only need the the base call here. But by putting this thing in, this gives us a place to drop a breakpoint, which we will do. Um, the theory I have here is this guy here. Yeah, yeah. I have a theory that this thing should probably be framework property metadata. I So theory here is, this should be framework property metadata. And then this guy has a flags up here that we do uh, where we can tell it that it affects measure affects a range. Uh, this is the wrong one. I wanted to do Y. They probably all should be changed, but the one we're playing with right now in our storyboard is this one. So we're going to play with this. Uh, framework property metadata. We're going to turn both on for the moment. Because we're going to go aggressive because it's not working and we want to get it to a working state. We're going to do that. We're going to do this first and see if this makes a difference. Because I have a feeling then as the storyboard is updating our rotation Y property, that should trigger an arrange and a measure. Or at least invalidate us for the arrange measure. Uh, okay, so this is the old one. Don't care. And then we're going to click here. Measure. Update 3D. Only triggered once. But this guy, I think, triggers a ton. How? Why? Why? Why do you get to trigger a bunch and I don't? Because you come in here, and it's not actually the call to update rotation that's doing it, is it? Actually, maybe it is. Maybe it is. What is the order of these calls? Update 3D, update rotation, measure override. Update 3D, measure override. Update 3D, measure override. Update 3D, measure override. So update rotation. Okay. Date rotation twice. Measure override. Date 3D, measure override. Update 3D, measure override. And neither one of you have meaningful call stacks, do you? Uh, let's see. Um... Uh, Dispatcher invoke, because I want to know what is triggering you to be invalidated. Something is invalidating you that causes you to need to be remeasured, 
Why does it think it needs to measure you? Why does it think it needs to measure you? Someone. What is this? Okay, is it coming from the base? Let's see. Busy, busy, busy. Okay. Your studio, you're only going to have a few moments to figure yourself out. Okay. Let's see here. Use layout rounding, measure override. How do how do we get here? Set measure core, right? This is this is fine. We we get the DPI, we get all the stuff, we apply the template, do a bunch of stuff with margin and size and measuring and blah 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 blah. But there's not a condition under which measure override is invoked or not invoked. It is straight up because you are in measure core UI element um, measure. Yeah, think think for a minute. I'd really like it if you could do this a little quicker. I realize these are kind of big files, but Okay. So this is inside of a try, which is inside of an else. So not exactly a great check. Um never measured false and dispatcher disable processing so this is coming in from the measure update layout fire on render callback this is what i'm confused on is something is telling it that this control is one that needs to be looked at i don't understand why it's getting itself in there uh let's go here because i think this might be the first one ui element why are you why is ui element an important thing here okay so ui element we're coming in here has dirtiness post layout okay so something in here is giving it a trigger this is uglier than i'll get out to look at so this is context layout manager update layout. We're going to cheat. Uh, we're going to just go look at it over here because it's probably easier to look at. Uh, context layout manager. Thank you. And then I would like to look at it here. No, it's here. Uh, let's see. Update layout. Thank you. That's all I wanted. See? Much easier to look at. Still looks bloody ugly, but mildly better. So we have current element here, and at some point, current element gets down into a case where it is being measured. What was the what was the bit that we saw? UI element dot measure is invoked. That's a range. UI element dot measure. So somewhere in here, this guy is looping. He is finding stuff. Uh, get topmost with no more measure candidates. So somewhere he gets assigned measure Q. So something put him into the measure Q that got him queued up for this. So something is telling it that it is needing to be remeasured. What makes it think it needs to be remeasured? Because even though it takes in this final size, even though it takes in this final, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This creates a visual child and adds it as a nested child. This element that it is being, that it is building up, this viewport 3D, if it is a child element, if this is a child element of it, it is very likely that as he changes and is updated, he is what is causing the layout. Okay, so, okay, next working theory. Previously, this visual child was being added um, inside 
And I think what we can do is we can do something similar. We just have to do it at a slightly different time. Um, we're going to come in here and nope, we are going to go into our plain 3D new. And we are going to just do this. Uh, viewport 3D. And up here, we are going to do remove visual child viewport 3D and something akin to that. And then I think what we want, um, this guy was basing it all on visual child. I don't, but visual child was set here. And so it was all about taking that visual child, creating it and adding it, and then the get visual child. I don't know why we needed to override this, because once you add it, shouldn't this have been handled for you? Should you pass it into the base? Like what like what would this be doing that wouldn't be adding this to a collection of children? I don't think we need those. I think this may have been to circumvent other stuff in here. I am wondering if the logical child matters, but we're going to try this. Because that, that gets it in. I do wonder if we're gonna have to do like a, a, a measure on, on it or not, but. Okay, uh, we're gonna disable some breakpoints real quick. Like uh, all of these ones I don't care about right now. That goes away, that goes away, that's go away, away, and we disable all of these. Turn these two breakpoints on. Go, okay. Now we click here. There's a measure, there's an update. That's it, only one. It's gotta be something with the child being added. It's gotta be, it's gotta be. That's, that's where I got my money. It is with one of these children being added that is triggering, because what I, what I have to believe is happening is Rotation Y is being fired, which is call, which is repeatedly calling update rotation. And we're looking at the old code right now, just to be clear. This Quantarian rotation, this guy here, is only referenced in a handful of places. Um, but more importantly, it's this rotation transformation. This rotation transformation is shoved into this transform 3D group. This 3D group is shoved into here, which is shoved into here, which goes through all of this stuff to make it into this viewport 3D. Important part here is this viewport 3D was returned back in the one instance where it's created and it's added as a visual child. This guy here is added as a visual child. I mean, it could be this layout invalidation catcher. How often are you hit during a rotation? Are you just, are, are you what's doing it to me? And maybe that's the whole comment about it not being propagated up and that's why, why it's being done there. Measure override. Because it is calling invalidate measure on the parent. Didn't hit that many times though. Measure, arrange, arrange, twice. Uh, would the layout invalidation catcher cause it to measure? Uh, it could, it could. So it's a decorator which sits at a um, a higher level in the in the Z order. Because decorators are usually used for like your, your resizing handles or things that are intended to be kind of above where the visual tree would normally sit. Um, and that layout and validation catcher is added as a logical child. 
And it makes sense that if a logical child uh, has a change that occurs to it, that it would then make a shift. And the one thing, oh, the... This one, this guy couldn't account for all of it. I think the reason he exists is because partway through the animation on the um, on the flip of the old one, uh, they toggle. So this is halfway when the when the door is straight there. They toggle the visibility of the two presenters, which is where it gets the shift between front and back. So basically. At the point, the thing is, uh, you're looking down the paper's edge rather than either side of the paper. They resize the paper, um, which would change the size of this grid. Because these two content presenters are in the same grid. And what this logical child contains is the original child, which would be the grid. And so he would be, his child that he's watching is the grid. And he, when that receives the the measure override because the child has changed size, so it now knows, hey, I need to, you know, child has changed visibility. I need to remeasure and lay myself out. It then says, ah, but I've also got a reference to my parent, so I'm going to call invalidate measure on the parent to tell it, ah, you've got to go through and remeasure yourself, which would certainly trigger at least one of these measure overrides. Like at least one of these would be triggered by the that size change occurring. But one, two, three, four. Yeah, but there's a there's half a dozen in there. That's where I'm a little confused. Because that my my hesitation of putting this in is I don't have a good way of replicating this behavior of putting both items in as a child of this. Or do I? Or do I? Do I have a way of just leveraging this straight? Because I could child is a content property. Hmm. I could do something similar, I guess, where I pull them together. The the problem is is I can't put the content inside. That's what's really getting me is I, I can't actually put them directly in there without problems because I really, 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 really don't want them inside of this because the, the fact that they're, re the, that they're removed, it's kind of what causes this whole rendering problem. But I don't understand what is triggering this to change to, to have the size changes over and over there's a logical child there with a measure and a desired size based on the size of the logical substance we want to align with it measure the size of the logical child i mean we can certainly do similar, I guess. Right? Like we can we can we can kind of start to mimic some of this. Um so I oh I guess we've already got the code right here, but if let's see, starting content is well we can just do is not null. All right, uh Pattern match. Pattern match. Follow the good practice. Starting content. Okay. So before it was logical child, but we can then do. The, the The issue I have here is I'm I'm now measuring something outside of myself, and I 
don't like that. I, I guess at the end of the day, really what, what they're going for is they want result to get set, right? So they want result here, and we could just do starting content desired size. Because it's supposed to be outside of me, I don't need to call measure. And then they were calling measure on the visual child. Well, that's interesting. They were calling measure on the visual child. Uh, uh, so we're going to do this. What were they caching the visual child as? Because they were caching that framework element, so they were upcasting that. We're gonna we're we're not gonna cache it. We're gonna we're gonna do something much more abusive uh, as framework element. Okay, we're gonna do we're gonna just do that for the moment. Uh, and then this was not a call to base. This was return result that goes like that I don't really want to call I mean, we can do this maneuver again down here um, arrange new Final size, so we can do we can do something akin to that, to see if that makes any difference. Did they return the base from their arrange or not? Yeah, they return the base. Okay. Okay. Oh, hold up. We got breakpoints still set in the other side. We're going to just turn them all off. Fire in the hole. Okay. And then... Uh, time for me to go break some code up set a project manager and save lives. Good luck, Izzy. Have fun. Okay. Click. Specified index or the child that index is null. Do not call this if visual children count returns zero, indicating the visual has no children. Okay, so if greater than zero, fine, I will not be quite as abusive. Uh, if, yep. Thank you, Copilot. I appreciate you. Okay, and we're gonna put we're gonna put breakpoints inside of here because I want to confirm that we actually get inside this. I wanna I wanna see it. I wanna see it do something, something of importance. Okay, and flip. We never got inside of either of our calls. Okay, do we get inside of this ever? I'm assuming we get inside of here at least once. Okay, so we get in here. Starting content, desired size. Desired size is zero. Did we ever add in the visual child? Maybe we should maybe we should confirm that we've actually added them. Probably a worthwhile a worthwhile thing to check. Continue. Continue. Uh don't need you. Okay, let's see. Did we ever set our visual child? 
Or do we just not have any visual children because viewport 3D Actually, you know what we could do is rather than getting Visual Child, we've already got Viewport 3D. That's what's being set. Let's just, okay, let's let's yank out this stupid if condition. And let's just do um, Viewport 3D, right? And we'll do that because that's functionally what the individual one should be. Even though we're caching it two different ways. Those should hold the exact same values, I expect, right? Because this one sets uh, the only place Visual Child gets assigned. Let's go back to my references. The only assignment to Visual Child is here. This create Visual Child always returns viewport three D. So they're caching it in two fields. Same value. Okay, if I click here, there was something that happened. It wasn't interesting, but it was a something. Um, Breakpoint on, breakpoint on, measure. Arrange. I'm wondering if we can get away here with uh, invalidate measure. I'm wondering if we can do that. I wonder if that does it, 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 because we know that's being invoked. So I wonder if we just invalidate ourselves repeatedly every time that is set. <gasps> it was a sizing thing there, but Okay, hang on. I, I it feels something's different here. Something something feels different. Can't can't prove it. Can't prove it yet. Can't prove it yet. But hang on. Something something feels different. If I do this. Yeah, that actual height and actual width. Hey, JC, how you doing? Good morning. We are trying to get this flipper to not suck. At least that's the goal. Uh, the problem is, is this flipper does a nice, pretty animation. This flipper, even though it looks pretty, no pretty animation. So that is the current investigation. Um, okay, so we grab this guy. We know that fires. Okay. I'm wondering, can I watch, does it have a layout or measurement updates? Size changed, unloaded. I don't know if it gives me those. Because those would be like spammy, 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 spammy. I don't think those show up. I love how tree view item is there. Okay, so that that that's not going to let me watch it there. Um, I'm curious though. There's something. What is it that I want to see? I want to know. This plane 3D clearly has size being given to it. It doesn't have any children. And I'm wondering if it should. Oh, I wonder if we can just do this. 
Okay, let's let's try let's try this. Let's try this. Rather than doing all this measuring garbage again, let's just let's get rid of all this again. Get rid of this. Return base measure override. I I okay working working another working idea, another working idea. We get rid of we get rid of this garbage, and instead what we do, instead what we do, is not add content equals, right? No thinking, no fanciness. We just straight up assign. Nothing nothing fancy at all. We go to a content control. And then we don't have to deal with anything else. We can get rid of this guy. We need him. He's back on the other side. Okay. We just go to a straight up content control. Because we know that the, the original control fires these measure and arrange things repeatedly. It gets invalidated over and over and over. And those repeated invalidations give it an opportunity to re readjust itself and redraw. And my my theory here, and and we should probably validate that this gets that this gets beat on too. Okay, so that that didn't do much. But if we come here, we do this: Bing, Bing, Bing. Only two hits. What? One call stack. Show me call stack. Rotation Y. Yeah, I agree. I'm sorry, what? How? Huh? No, we know that there should be a lot more of these coming through. I wonder if it's timing. Uh, okay, so let's do an action here. Uh, Kevin, that'll work. I just, I, I have this weird theory that because I'm breakpointing it, I'm not seeing all of them. Okay, so that that makes a little more sense. There, there is a, a metric ton of them coming through, but when you're on a breakpoint, you're mucking with the timing. Okay, so that, that gives me that gives me something to go on. Okay, so maybe a breakpoint isn't the the greatest for what we're doing. But let's go up here. Uh let's do actions and call this uh measure. And then let's see what happens now. Lots of measure passes. Lots of measure passes. Let's just confirm because it looked like they were one to one. Yeah, pretty much one to one. The measure occurs, then Kevin repeatedly. Which sort of makes sense. Because we told it that um, the framework properties for this affected measure and affected arrange. So we sort of expected that every assignment up above was going to then trigger a measure pass. And if we look at the thingy here, and if we move this to the side, and we move this to the side, and we come in here and look at this guy, uh, let's see, do, 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 content presenter, that content, plain 3D. So the nice part is this thing now actually shows content inside of him. So that's that's better. Um, Now we can actually see these things. So if I take this guy, does he ever change size during this? He goes to 
to 256, 200. So he is changing in size. Surprised Snoop initially reported him as zero, but he's got a height and a width, or measured height and a width. Um, can I look at desired size? Interesting, his desired size is zero. Ah, I think Snoop is lying to me. I think there's an extra change in there that isn't making it all the way to me. Uh, I don't think it's seen all of the size changes in here. Now, I think that is an event. I can grab, get rid of all the mouse events. We don't care about those. Uh, let's see. Text input, also don't care. Uh, there is a, could have sworn I saw it earlier. Where is it? Size changed. Size changed. There we are. So I would like to clear this. Thank you. And I'm going to shrink you. And I'm going to move you over. And I, oh, nope, nope, nope. Bad Visual Studio. Bad Visual Studio. Uh, I am going to collapse this window here. And that clearly triggered a lot of size changes because I just resized the window. That's fine. Here. Size changed here. There was a lot of size changes. But only two on this guy. And I suspect it has to do with the storyboard we put together for him. The do 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 this guy. Oh, we got rid of all of his thingies, didn't we? Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm looking at the wrong one. There we go. Okay, so we still have these guys in place to toggle him on and off. You know what, let's, let's just leave him on all the time. And if I need past him, I'll toggle him in Snoop. Cause I kinda wanna see him, I kinda wanna see him render something like I, that that's the thing is i still haven't seen him render anything and i'd kind of like to see that i've gotten this into a point where he can render it I'm trying to think of what i'm doing wrong here okay so i can't click which kind of makes sense um, we'll come in here, and I think what we'll do is we'll just make him hit test visible false. So I can click through him. Um, I think that's the game plan here. Uh, hit test visible off. Now we should be able to click him. Nope. Oop, oop, oop. Come back. Now I can go click. Okay, so I, that um, one he should probably never be is test visible false so he should probably never be clickable especially if he's always going to be sitting on top of the content okay that doesn't that doesn't get me anywhere what have we done wrong 
We could also hard code his width and height. Because we could make this a 200 to make sure he always has plenty. And we could make this a 256. That way he doesn't resize. But he's not showing up and he's not rendering the animation. And that's what's bothering me the most is because he should be. He should be. Is it possible? Because this rotation Y property lives on. You no, know, I wonder, were we looking at the wrong? I don't think so. Right, when I click this, I see the animation go. Yeah. The animation goes. It 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 does numbers. It it can count. Like that that makes sense. And we know that this guy here An update 3D should be coming into here. I wonder if this logical bounds, well, this is only width height. So the key thing, I guess the question then is what changes over here in this update 3D? When we hit this, what is actually changing? All right, so we should hit this a bunch. Oh, uh, fine. I'll relaunch. Because when we do this update 3D, field of view in radians, sure, fine. I remember a bit of my calculus. But what property in here is actually adjusting this? Because z-axis, y-axis should be fixed. Those aren't going to be changing. Okay, fine. I'm turning you off for a minute. Turn you off for a minute. Because z-axis and y-axis are going to be fixed. It's got to be the field of view property that's changing. And maybe that's my problem is I'm looking at the wrong thing. Where is this used? I'm realizing I don't remember. It is never being set. No. Really? So is it literally this descendant bounds that's changing? Is that what's is that is that what is causing this? Is that what's making my life miserable? Let's see. Logical bounds. Okay. We're just gonna catch it here, I guess. 200, 256, 200, 256, 256. That wasn't it. Okay, Z factor is fixed, I believe. Z axis is fixed. Y axis is fixed. I think we can pretty much confirm that, right? Yeah. Um, field of view appears to be fixed as well. So this guy is firing a ton.
and the perspective camera is getting the exact same values every time. Maybe I should catch it here instead so I can see more values. Right, that, it like... Okay, actions, update, logical bounds, close, come here, open output, pin, clear, click. So during that animation, there were, what is that, eight calls? with two different values. One, that's incredibly wasteful. Because height and width are going to be fixed. Then... Okay, so this might be a red herring to chase because this doesn't, like, do anything. Like, it seems like the perspective camera is changing. But it also seems like because there's only two values here that this is all around that halfway point where the content changes and the visibility swaps and then it relays this out. So it's hitting this way more than it needs to, but it's... Uh, but it's not that big of a thing and it's probably still... Uh, it's probably still here then. So if we clear this now, we'll come back here and we click. Don't see it. I am missing something. I can't imagine it's this. I mean, we can put this in, but I don't, I can't, no, that can't be it, can it? Because really what I want to get down to is having this plain 3D control where I can point it at another UI element. That's what I, I that's what I want. This is so bloody close. I like what have I done wrong here? Because this starting and ending content is it an issue of the content being visible versus collapsed? Is that like am I running into timing problems? of the point at which I'm taking the snapshots. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's the fundamental issue is I, the other one was always content, always visible. So the element was always there, but it was being changed. Whereas these ones are being toggled. Maybe that's the difference. If that's the case, what we could do is we could get rid of the show hide bits of these, which is like the entire storyboard. Um, I guess we, we probably want to leave the visual state, but we can whack the entire storyboard. We can whack... The entire bit here and we can whack this here and then we'll try that and see maybe maybe it is just an issue of I'm attempting to grab a visual brush at a point where the content is 
not shown. Which would kind of make sense. So now we should see overlapping bits. Good. So if I click this, and I don't see anything, and I obviously don't expect to see a visual change because it's not, there's nothing there. Like the, the controls now are just sitting on top of each other. It's fine. That's what we, it's what we told it to do. So this guy here has a size. And then bothers me that this one doesn't show a rendered picture, which makes me strongly suspect that some, that that's where the problem actually lies. Uh, let's see. What happens if we just need to size this guy? Uh, width is 200. And height is 256. Oh. That got me to a... Uh, thingy I now it now it now visible okay let's just shift it so I can click past it uh, margin left of I don't know 50 boom okay so I shove that thing to the side for a moment oh Guys, guys, look, look, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. I'm so happy right now. <gasps> it's the wrong content. But who cares? I made a door open and close. And the door is always in the same state, which is very interesting. It's like you've painted the door the same color. Okay. Okay, so in order to get this to render like this, what we ended up doing was sizing the rectangle appropriately inside of the viewport 2D, 3D. I... That sort of makes sense because the rectangle itself would have no concept of how big it's supposed to be because all we did was set its background brush as we set where where's that rectangle where is it yeah we set the the fill brush and setting a fill brush doesn't give it any inherent knowledge of size so in an ideal situation, we would want its size to be coupled to its parent. I wonder if we can get it to size properly if we uh, let's see horizontal so if we do Because the horizontal alignment on the rectangle is stretch, but the parent that holds it doesn't really have that concept. So we almost want to bind the rectangle's size to the... Okay, 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 two can play at this game. Now, now we're cooking with fire. Okay. Rectangle. Uh, rectangle. That sounds great. Um, we'll set its fill. No, quit trying to do a solid color brush. 
Pay attention, co-pilot. Pretend to be a real developer. Okay. Uh, no, we are not trying to cache it right now. We don't care about performance. Make it work, make it right, make it fast. Okay, set binding. And we want to tie its width property to the... Uh, uh, we'll do a new binding. Why am I, why am I, can I not spell binding? Oh, I just don't have it included. Okay. And the source of the binding is going to be uh, the starting content and the, uh, uh, yeah, sure. Mode can be one way. That's fine. And then we would like the path to be, um, Uh, let's see here. I think we can just do strings, right? Do you have an implicit conversion or do I have to get fancy? Oh. New property path. See, this is what all the XAML is getting you, in case people wonder. Um, string path. There we go. Okay. So in this case, though, I think what I want to do is uh, actual width property dot name so that's a lot of typing for very little gain but we are setting up a binding the binding is going to point to the actual width property the source of the binding is going to be our starting content that will ensure that our rectangle has a matching width to the thing that we just filled with the visual brush we are going to do the same thing to height actual height okay and that should work there and then down here we will make you the the rectangle okay let's try this oh i just realized we're probably gonna have to snoop in and set a margin so that we can click past it but i want to see it work without me having to hard code the site like okay so well it at least rendered something so that's that's a step in the right direction you have rendered something you are not completely a worthless piece of garbage okay so we will now do margin just to uh i think we do margin up here though and we do I don't know, 50, 50 pixels, just to shift it off to the side so that I can get to the button behind it. Okay. So that, that now works. So let's go back. So that's without having to hard code the width and the height property on those. So now let's see if we can put these back and see how we do with them um we don't want these we do want this we do want this we do want this we do want this um, we're going to leave off the direct states for the moment. It probably means we're going to see an animation and then a reversion, but that's, I'm kind of okay with that at the moment. Oh, uh, but the reversion means I'm not going to be able to see my stuff if I don't do them. So we're going to put them on. Okay, we will turn them on, and then this will make me very happy if we can get this flipper working, because this will solve a lot of bugs. Because the flipper is currently one of those controls that's been on my radar of things to kill. It used to be combo box, and then we kind of 
Nixed all those. Okay, so something is not not right in Whoville. Uh, okay, so what is not right in Whoville? Um, one, that looks like crap now, so we have a problem there. Uh, okay, so this guy is covering... Uh, so we've got an issue of visibility, right? Yeah. So we've got an issue of visibility because this guy is showing up when he should have been marked as hidden. Uh, let's see here. Oh, because we turned it, we, we, okay, right, 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 right. We had initially done collapsed on him, and I forgot to revert that. Okay, so that was that problem. Okay, so that's... So part of the issue is I am not updating this properly when the content changes. Because we are always bound, we don't re we don't change our because I think the issue here is right now when we're capturing this is the content inside that we are capturing is not accurate. And we don't update. And I suspect that is the problem. Uh, let's see here. If we look at this guy, look at this guy. He has a size. Uh, let's see if I just make him visible, right? Because I can I can now turn him on. That's what he looks like, but the other content, because it's hidden, when it's grabbing the visual brush for it, it doesn't it doesn't grab anything, so there's nothing for it to properly size to. Hmm. That is an interesting problem because how do you show like I want to render the item without making it fully visible but it's hidden so I, I don't have a clean way of doing that I wonder how to get around that I wonder how to get around that I'm wondering if what I'm bumping into is the there's some optimizations in WPF around not rendering things that are collapsed or invisible for obvious reasons, but I kind of want to render an invisible thing. Because how would I get the other control in order to snapshot him without making him visible? I wonder if I could snapshot him if he were visible and just placed outside of the control with clipping turned on. Because I could apply a transform to him, shift him, like, shift him to the left, like, whatever its width is, snapshot him, bring it in, pull it up. Like, I could do something like that. That's a thing. It's an awkward thing because I, how do you do a sizing? 
you almost have to put it in a canvas or something where mm, but then i mm, yay 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 okay this can be weird okay well step one um Product kind of not working. Yeah, we're going to do that for now. And we're going to commit and push. Because unfortunately, it's midnight. And I have reached the point where I don't know if I can think my way through this problem. So. Can you have a rectangle that matches the background? I could. I think the hard part for me, though, is the the size of this control. So the the flipped content is so much bigger. And I don't know how, like, how do I get a a picture of this control rendered properly without showing something at least of this size? Because I could take this control, hide it off to the side, like I could throw it as a negative whatever, transform, snapshot it, and then render that picture over here. But the moment I do that, because he is a child of the flipper, the flipper's size is going to increase. And so that's the that's the weird part. It's like, well, I don't control whether the user is going to set the flipper to, you know, vertical alignment stretch or whether they're going to set a physical height or whatnot. So I don't know how to properly do it. And more importantly, I wouldn't want to, like if there were controls underneath this, I wouldn't want to have them appear to drop down while the control got big enough to render the control that it knows it's going to size to and then do it like it, there's there's a weird thing happening and i don't know the proper solution here which is what's weird yeah so there's something hmm 